Well, I never thought I'd live to see the day. This is a this is a Linux distro, but it looks uncannily like Windows 11. Today's video is going to be uh, not quite a distro review because to be honest, I don't have the time or the patience for this particular project. But what we are going to do is uh, take a look at Linux effects and kind of do a reaction video to it. Uh, people put me onto this distribution because of its ability to ape Redmond's operating system. And this is just the live image. We're going to install it. We're going to poke around in it and we're going to see uh, what value, if any, this sort of project provides. Now, all I know about this project is that it originates in Brazil, that it has quite a medium size or, you know, popular ish user base. Uh, in that, at least on SourceForge, it reports having, you know, over a thousand downloads a week, which is not insignificant. And that this particular version uses the Plasma desktop or a heavily customized version of the Plasma desktop. So all that's kind of fascinating on some level. Stick along for the ride and we'll just poke this thing and see where it can go. So this project is fascinating to me for a number of reasons. Let's just start up the installation process. We'll make some observations as we go. All right, so first of all, it would seem that we've got a really decent ape of the Windows 11 scheme or the, th the theming. We do seem to be using the Calamara's installer and I believe this is based on Ubuntu, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, yes, I definitely am doing this on a virtual machine because I do not want to install this particular thing on my uh, on my main hardware. But um, okay, and we've uh, lost our display settings, so that's fun. But I'll be interested to see if this thing can change my mind. I think though, one of the biggest uh, like obstacles to users being able to migrate from a different operating system is not just the software, it's also like the ecosystem that's built around it, the apps and the services that are uh, come built into these. Now, obviously one of the biggest criticisms that people have of Windows 11 is the fact that it's very difficult to use this beast without signing in to a Microsoft account. And that's problematic for people that don't want to give all of their data for, to Microsoft. And so uh, the question is, well, what alternatives are there out there? for secure cloud storage and uh, being able to back up photos and do all the things that a service like OneDrive and Microsoft accounts provides. Well, funny you should ask, because that's where today's sponsor, Internext, comes in. Today's episode is brought to you by Internext. Internext is a really fantastic open source private and encrypted cloud storage service that you can use to back up your own files and photos and other things. And it has clients available for the Linux desktop, Mac, Windows, Android, and iOS. Meaning that if you are looking for a drop-in replacement for something like Dropbox or Google Drive or something else that is a little more respective of your privacy, then Internext is a great option to check out. What I particularly appreciate about Internext is the fact that they use end-to-end -end encryption, not just when your files are in transit between your computer and their servers, but the entire thing from start to finish. They've got a really handy comparison here where you can see a feature for feature comparison with other popular cloud storage providers. And I think they do have a really compelling product that's under open source development and is compliant with all of the strictest laws about privacy and data collection uh, in the world currently. So check out Internext at the link in the description below, or you can use code infinitely galactic at checkout to save yourself 25% off all of the plans available. So again, if you're looking at de-googling your life or maybe adopting a more privacy compliant cloud storage provider, then definitely check out the open source end-to-end -end encrypted Internext in the description below. And thank you to Internext for sponsoring today's episode. I believe the intention behind this distribution is to be able to load it up on people's hardware. Say your grandma and grandpa and, and they won't even think twice that it's anything other than Windows. There is an inherent flaw in that strategy in that 
once you scratch below the surface, you're definitely not dealing with windows and that can create more problems than it solves. But I kind of am impressed just on the first presentation of the desktop as to just how closely they've managed to ape it. But I mean, even running along the toolbar here, the, the start menu looks bang on minus a few animations. Uh, the search functionality is, I think you launcher. That's what I'm guessing. If I search, yep, Dolphin is the file manager there. We have the virtual desktop view, which looks similar. We have the uh, widgets panel, which just brings up Plasma widgets, which already are really well fleshed out widgets. So glad to see Plasma gets a bit of a shout out there. Uh, chat, what does chat open? I don't know if it's the best idea to be doing this while I'm installing it, but, oh, it opens Teams, okay. This is interesting. Does that, okay, so we have Edge on the desktop and we have Teams included on the the start panel here and now we've got an audio. Okay, well, Teams doesn't seem to want to load right now. I'll try that once we finish installing. So does that mean this thing is gonna be filled with like Microsoft stuff? Because if so, that's interesting. I mean, not interesting for anyone who's interested in actual open source and using Linux because it's Linux, but interesting from a point of view of helping users migrate over, would they even know if they're migrating over if it's aping it this well? That's what I'd like to know. Okay, so we've got a lot of the Microsoft services links to online web apps. It'd be really sick if they had like a wine implementation of Office, although that would get weird because then you'd have to authenticate it with an account and the legality of that might become interesting. Actually, the legality of this whole project is, could be interesting. I'm curious as to know how that works. Because the other thing I noticed, and we might have to use a web browser once we get going here, is the, uh, is the pricing structure of this uh, distro in that it has a free version, which is obviously what I'm running here. But they also have kind of like a pro version in a very similar way to the same, uh, to the way that Zorin OS has a, like a fully loaded pro version. So we'll have a look at that shortly once this thing is finished installing. Okay, so first up, we had a little pop-up in the bottom corner here saying, you're using the free version, uh, there's a trial on some of the pro features. Okay, uh, might be worth us checking out what the pro features are. Um, now, this is an interesting choice. Obviously, this comes back to them wanting to smooth the transition from, a, from Microsoft Windows over to Linux. But I guess the question is, well, if you're wanting to make that transition uh, easier, don't know why we're gonna include every single Microsoft service uh, enabled out of the box. Again, I, I guess I'm asking like, who would this distribution be for? One of the things that I don't appreciate about Edge is all of this rubbish that we get on the front page. And then the fact that it, the browser just kind of takes over and just does whatever it wants to do for the first little while. I really hate this trend. Oh, okay. And now I need to do a reboot. So it's going to reboot. Okay. Well, that seems pretty in line with what we've come to expect from Windows. Okay, there it is. You're running the free version and there's a trial there for some of the tools. Okay, so let's poke around here and see what we're dealing with. Uh, so we have, like I mentioned, the menu and a lot of the included apps that I can see in the menu uh, do include a plenty of Microsoft services. It's kind of a mix between KDE apps and Microsoft web apps or a very few of the, the native Linux Microsoft apps, for example, Edge and Teams both have their own sort of native clients for those things. Uh, and then they've got a bunch of Microsoft icons applied to the KDE apps as well and other open source software like only Office, for example, has Microsoft uh, icons. Not really sure why. I totally buy the argument of muscle memory, which is why a lot of distributions do use the standard taskbar start menu approach that Windows became famous for. There's a reason for that. But again, going this far, I'm not really sure why. We've got a device manager or system info that looks really similar to what we've seen. Oh, crikey, no, I don't wanna do any benchmarking. Uh, that's really similar to what we see on the Windows side of things. What exactly is this? Oh, it's hard info, okay. The theming is almost spot on. Even the fonts, let's see what fonts these are using. Oh, interesting. System settings looks awfully similar to Windows 11. That's actually kind of spooky how close that is. And they give us a prompt to log into OneDrive. That's interesting. 
So now it's going to ask me to sign into my account and provide an authentication address into one. Oh, so we get out of the box OneDrive syncing with this baby. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, again, not my choice, but that could prove useful because OneDrive is notoriously hard to get up and running in Linux. So I wonder what kind of tech they're utilizing to get that done. We have the discover software center here as the software manager, which I think I approve of that. That's a good choice. What else have we got going on here? The Microsoft PowerShell. That doesn't seem right. It's console. This is okay. See, this is where I start taking issue with projects like this. When you start labeling things to kind of deliberately dupe the user into thinking that they're using a Microsoft product like Microsoft PowerShell, when in fact you, you're using an open source software done by KDE called console, that's where it starts getting a little bit off for me. Because at the end of the day, this is like hard work that the KDE Plasma team do. And to have it rebranded with, you know, quite possibly a rival uh, branding uh, is great for familiarity, but really bad for getting familiar with the open source world. Okay. It doesn't seem like there's too much else going on here. We do have steam installed out of the box. We do have uh, wine tricks and I'm going to guess that we've probably got wine support enabled out of the box. And what is the Linux effects desktop update? Oh, okay. So they have a custom update tool to help update the entire system. Okay. Cause there is like quite a fair bit going on here and it's good that they at least have their own tools to be able to update this thing. Do we still get access to the main KDE system settings or is it just their custom one? Okay. It would appear it's, it would appear it's just their custom settings. Can I open multiple versions? I can, huh? Recovery. Okay. So there's backups that you can use out of the box and you can enable system backups. That's good to see. And then it looks like these little sections just bump you out to the individual components of the KDE plasma system settings, uh, panels. So does that mean at the end of the day, this is just an app that hot links to the various parts of KDE system settings? If so, again, for discoverability and familiarization of where to look, I can appreciate that. Uh, it is worth mentioning also that they have a Windows 10 lookalike version of this as well, not just Windows 11. Because the other thing is, is that Windows 11 is still very new. If people are super familiar with Windows 11, or if they're getting super familiar, it means they're open to change, which means you may as well just get them using Linux that looks like Linux instead of Linux that looks like Windows. Ooh, okay, hang on. I didn't see that before. Apparently there is a Haloa, there is a voice assistant. That's new show commands. I don't think it's going to be connected to any of my mics on this virtual machine. Wow. Okay. So it even comes with its own voice assistant. That's kind of impressive. I guess I wonder if voice assistants are ever going to take off in the Linux space. I kind of doubt it. Okay. So the windows, windows seven, windows 10 version is made with cinnamon and the windows 11 lookalike is made with KDE plasma. And here's the breakdown. Okay. Android apps and games support. Oh, that only comes with a professional one. Okay. You get the desktop settings and tools. Wait, so you don't get that with the free one assistant. Oh shoot. Okay. Access to Microsoft stuff, including OneDrive and active directory are all in the professional one as well. Okay. 35 bucks. Okay. I think I've seen enough. Bamboozling is the word that's coming to mind. It's so good at aping it, but then it, this has got to be some interesting intellectual property ground here, like down to the fonts and the wallpapers, the iconography. Yeah, there's a lot going on here for sure. Next week's video, we'll be back to talking about uh, Linux desktop environments and, and stuff and things. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching if you made it this far. And uh, yeah, let me know, is there such a version? Is there such a thing as this operating system, but for Mac OS, like, is there just a shameless clone of Mac OS. Don't say elementary. That's not, that's not what that is. If you know of a, like a one for one drop in, like blink and you'd think it's the same thing replacement for Mac OS, let me know. And I'll react to that one as well. Anyway, bit of fun and games. See you in the next one.